This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Amen. Stand with us if you would. We're going to continue to worship. Let's rejoice together today. Amen? Amen. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. Oh, death tried to keep you inside of the grave. He fought you. He tried, but he lost. You cannot be stopped. When we cried for freedom, you tore down the wall. The weight of our burdens, you carried it. Our fears and our failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed. Stand on your victory. We shout out your praise. Oh, miracle maker, you're mighty to save. Awesome in power, relentless in love. You cannot be stopped. You're the mover of life. the mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, the battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. No grave. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. I love that song. Um, 
you cannot be stopped. There's a, that second line in there. <clears throat> the enemy, the enemy tried, but he lost. I love. That. I could just sing that same line over and over and over again because it's just so moving and powerful to me. Hey, I want to just say thank you for joining us today. If you're a newcomer to us, we hope you feel comfortable. And uh, actually, we'd love to have you come back and just keep coming. And you're joining us online for the first time. Uh, you've figured out how to find us, so join us each week in uh, 8.30 and 10 o'clock. We have some uh, special times together, but Pastor Trav has something kind of special he wants to share with you, too. Well, happy Easter, everyone. We're glad to see you. My name's Pastor Trav, as uh, <coughs> Pastor Doug said, and I'm on staff here, and I get to the pleasure of overseeing kids and youth, and um, man, what a, what a joy it is. I don't know if you do Easter baskets at home or what you guys do, um, but we, um, we just wanted to do a little, a little fun thing. It's not, it's not a big thing, but just a little bit. Um, and that's why if your parents were savvy on social media and whatnot, um, some of the kids might have picked up eggs and started eating the candy. Parents, totally okay. That's on you. I mean, if you don't want them to eat it, that's your fault. Um, that's your problem. It's not mine. <laughs> okay? That's, your, that's, that's on you. All right? But um, you will see eggs all over in here and in the foyer. Um, just pick those up, open them up, eat some, eat some candy. I guess if an adult... I mean, I, you know, no, I better not. I guess if you, yeah, go ahead. Get, just, just get one. See what's in there. You know, I guess if you want to do that, that's fine. I'm not going to care, right? But um, if you're an elementary kid, so if, I know that some of you guys have some preschoolers and kindergartners that are being, that are being taught in our class over here, which is awesome. And I want to th say thank you to all of our teachers, but especially Valentine and Signe, who choose, who choose to serve on Easter Sunday. Mm. Yeah, not, I didn't have to go find them. They said, we want Easter Sunday. Um, so I appreciate volunteers like that that will, that will come out and say, hey, I want to I help and I want to serve. So, um, but if you're an elementary kid, like fifth grade and under, why don't you just come up right now and just take a bucket? Um, they're yours. Don't, don't get shy. If you're too shy to come up, then you can do it afterwards. That's fine. But um, pick a bucket. If you have a kid that's in that younger age, and you're like, hey, I don't want them to miss out. Don't, don't let them miss out. Just come get one afterwards. Um, and take it with them. You know, students that are 6th through 12th grade, they get a little feelings hurt sometimes when younger kids get stuff. So if you're a youth student and you want some candy, come get it. I'm not going to throw it at you, all right? But if you're you, yeah, come on. I will throw it at you. Remember, I can see you all in here. No, but if you want a big old, yeah, do it. Take a, take a handful. This first, in the first service, they were, they were like, Thanks, and they took one piece. I was like, dude, come on. When have you ever been modest about it, right? Here you go. <laughs> there you go. Take a handful. Hey, I don't want to take any of this home. All right, if you're... Okay, do that. Thank you. Hey, if you, if you are a youth student and you feel like you just can't live without some candy, there it is. All right, um, let, me, let me just point out two things really quickly um, because I think Pastor Doug... Um, has an amazing message to share with us. But in these, this symbol, I mean, it's, it's just little, right? It's just little. It's just some candy. It's just a little bucket with some stuff in it. But there's two things that I want to point out. One is that we can be generous because God was generous to us, right? And that's what we're celebrating this weekend is we can actually give things away and we can actually give people things freely because God gave his son for you and I. Mm -hmm. Right? So no matter what kind of basket or money or whatever I could put together could never amount or equal what God has already given to us. So that should, that should generate generosity inside of us to live as, as people of followers of Christ <clears throat> that see the generosity and that we give to others and we share it with others, right? The second thing is, if you took a basket, you're looking through it, there's some cool things in there. There's also an egg, right? And so if you open that egg, you will find nothing right now some of the kids are like this is a crock i got ripped <laughs> they're putting together easter baskets and they missed my egg this is no you know but here's here's the thing we didn't forget every single basket up here has an empty egg in it and here's what i would hope that you would do with that egg right that you would see open that egg and you'd see emptiness in there and most of the time when we see emptiness we think bummer shoot I missed it, darn it, fill in the blank, despair, I lost. But when we open that egg, we see what, we saw, what, the, what the women saw Easter 
morning, we saw emptiness in there. They saw emptiness in there, and it wasn't sad. It wasn't sorrowful. It wasn't bummer. It wasn't, hey, who gypped us out of something? It was that moment where they saw that emptiness brought encouragement. Emptiness brought wholeness. Emptiness brought healing. And so, yeah, I know when we think about empty, we don't always think about that. We don't always think of that terms. But maybe when you take that egg and you put it next to your bed or you put it somewhere where you're going to see it more often and you crack it open every once in a while and you just think, man, it's way more important to see the empty egg than it is to have a piece of a Tootsie Roll or something inside of there. Because that's what, we, that's what we've come to celebrate this morning is that resurrection power that the tomb was empty. Your one egg in your basket can be empty. Listen, all the other eggs are full of stuff or should be unless adults got to them first and then put them back. That's something I would do. I'd open it, put it in my pocket, and then I'd just be like, oh, yeah, they missed one over here. Sorry, son. You know, like, that's the way I'd handle it. But hopefully in those two things, just in that a couple of quick minutes, kids, guys, gals, that we can focus on that, that we can be generous people because God gave to us and that we can see an empty tomb is not a despair or a sorrow, but as an encouragement and excitement this morning. Pastor Doug. Amen. Thank you, Trav. And uh, please do take advantage of all these, uh, these things and look around. I see an egg right down there, and Adrian will be sneaking over during the service trying to grab that. But uh, anyways, yeah, grab those, take them with you, and uh, we're so delighted that you're with us today. And it's, been, it's a joy just to celebrate. Hey, we're going to be moving really fast through this, and I normally have a PowerPoint. I do not today because I think it'd be more of a distraction than not, but uh, buckle the sheet belts. Let's get going. Let's jump right into the message this morning. I want to talk to you about a message I've titled, Hope, the Resurrection Changes Everything. The Resurrection Changes Everything. I want you to think about it for a moment. 33 AD, uh, when Jesus, when all this happened, when the first Easter happened and, and Jesus died on the cross and then he rose again, uh, 33 A.D., we know because of Acts chapter 1, verse 15, that there was, there was 120 followers of Jesus. Now, that number is important. Think about that for a second. 120 followers of Jesus in 33 A.D. Here's something that's mind-boggling to me. Do you know if you fast forward to today, there's 2.3 billion, that's with a B, 2.3 billion people that claim to be followers of Jesus. That's one out of three people on planet Earth. Amen. Think about that. Isn't that amazing? The church by far is the largest organization on Earth. Think about that. Now, here, give you a little bit of perspective. Let me just throw something at you. Maybe it's hard to get your head around 2.3 billion. It is for me. So the church, picture this. The church of Jesus Christ is bigger than than China. Well, wait a minute. The, yes, it's like a Ron Popeil commercial. There's, but there's more. <laughs> the church is bigger than China and Europe combined. Oh, but wait. Yep. The church is bigger than China, Europe, and the USA all put together. The largest organization on the planet. Now, I've got to ask you a question. 120 people in 33 AD to 2.3 billion today. How can that happen? I'll tell you why. The resurrection changes everything. The single most important event in history, and I'm saying that carefully and meaningful, the single most important event in history is the resurrection. It divides our history. I don't know if you come to think about that or not, but you've got B.C. and A.D. What's separate? The resurrection. Your birthday, every event that we celebrate, think about it. Your birthday, every other event that we celebrate here on earth is divided by that moment. It's, it's judged and dated by that moment. The resurrection changes everything. Think about that for a moment. I want to give you this morning, and we're going to race through these pretty quickly, but I want to give you four things that I believe Jesus' resurrection provides hope for us. I was, I was listening to a message by 
uh, Rick Warren, pastor at Saddleback Church in California, had, had very similar to this. And some of these points were uh, motivated by that list, what I was listening to him share at that time. But I want to tell you the first thing that's really, really important. The first thing that gives us hope based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, now listen to this, we can be totally, totally forgiven. Oh, come on. That's weak sauce for an Easter. <laughs> because of the resurrection, we can be, you guys are just as sleepy. What, what is it with the first gathering? They were a little bit comatose too. We had to kind of pull them in. But, but uh, the resurrection changes everything. We can be totally forgiven. Now, yeah, there you go. There you go. Jesus told his disciples, think about it. Jesus told his disciples, he said this. He said it more than once. I'm going to die on a cross to pay for your sins. But then I'm going to come back to life in three days to prove that I am who I say I am. I'm going to go to the cross and die for your sins, but I'm going to come back to life in three days, just like I said, to prove what I'm talking about. Rick Warren said it this way. He said, if he hadn't done the second part, the first part doesn't really matter. At first I thought, wait a minute, hold on. And then I got to thinking about it. I thought, you know, that's absolutely the truth. If, we, if just the cross, listen, not, I, I realize just the cross, but I'm saying if we stop at the cross, we have forgiveness of sins. The, the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who knew no sin, this is what the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So why? So that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, he accomplished something we could never, ever accomplish in our lifetime. Listen, no matter how hard I try, I can't be good enough. I can't be righteous enough. I can't be holy enough. I can't keep making enough good decisions to earn or be what God has called me to be. I can't do that without his help. And he died on the cross. He took our place. And because of that, we have forgiveness of sins. But really, really important to us is to remember that he rose again on that third day, and that changes everything. Because not only are we forgiven, now we have the promise of eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven. When I first started in the ministry, you had a little guy, I shouldn't say it that way, I, just, I always say that because he's about this tall and about this big around. A guy named Pastor Earl Book. He was my superintendent in the first, when I first started in ministry, and um, he was my boss, basically, but he, he oversaw the Oregon Ministry Network. It was called the Oregon District at that time, and he's a little short guy, but he had one of those, he, have you ever met people have kind of a cartoon face? You know what I'm talking about? I'm, that's not disrespectful. I'm just saying you look at him, and it just look like, you want to smile. I mean, there's just something about, had this round, pudgy face that always had a smile, on, big kind of, big eyes, and this just, I'm, he was a lot better looking than what I'm describing, but I mean, <laughs> but I mean, just had that face, you know, when you looked at it, you just couldn't help but smile. And when he'd get excited about something like what I just shared with you, he would, he would just do this. He'd go, hallelujah. <laughs> I want you to think about it. He died on the cross. He forgave our sins. But on the third day, he rose again, and we have eternal life because of that. We are totally forgiven. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7 says, So we praise God for the glorious grace that he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave us. Our sins. I want to ask you a quick question you never thought you'd be asked on Easter Sunday. Who killed Jesus? Think about that for a minute. Who really killed Jesus? Well, I'll tell you what, it wasn't Judas, it wasn't Caiaphas, it wasn't Herod, it wasn't the Jews. It's pretty obvious who killed Jesus. Let's look at it in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, talking about Jesus, prophetically talking about Jesus. Isaiah, pardon me, Isaiah the prophet says this. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. He, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. 
He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sin, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so that we could be whole, whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. But it was the Lord's good plan. Don't miss that part of this passage. It was the Lord's good plan. What are you talking about? The Lord's good plan to kill his son. You know, I just, in my mind, I see this happening as I'm thinking about this discussion that went on before we even, before Adam and, even, Adam and Eve even were, this plan was in place. Because God was allow anything to separate us in our relationship with him and there was this this controversy that so we were going to break the rules we were going to sin but how do we keep relationship but God is because God is perfectly just and perfectly righteous and a sacrifice had to be made and like I quoted a moment ago from second Corinthians he who knew no sin became sin for Jesus said I'll go he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. According to this passage, we killed Jesus. According to this, this passage, it was God's plan for Jesus to die. More specifically, our sin nailed him to the cross. If we hadn't sinned, he wouldn't need to have died. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says this, he was handed over to die because of our sins. He was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. Hallelujah. Raised to life to make us right with God. The resurrection changes everything. Number two point I want to share with you this morning is this, that we no longer have to fear death. Because of the resurrection, we no longer have to fear death. Boy, I'll tell you what, in the world we've been living in for the last year plus, a lot of death, a lot of sorrow, a lot of suffering, a lot of loss. And I'm not talking just about COVID. I'm talking about life in general. We all have just life goes on regardless of the pandemic. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of loss that we've experienced. Death by, by, the, by the virus, death by isolation, death by discouragement and depression, death by, I mean, on and on the list goes. We have had a lot of loss in this last year. But the resurrection changes everything. And because he lives, we no longer have to fear death. When he rose from the grave, he did this. He broke the power of death. And with it, he broke the fear of death. Jesus is talking to his disciples, uh, in particular, uh, Lazarus' uh, sister. As they remember, you you remember the story. Jesus was called because Lazarus' his friend was dying. In fact, did die. And Jesus got there, and, and of course, ultimately raised him back to life. But on the way to the tomb, Jesus is talking with his sister, <clears throat> and he says this. He says, "I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone, anyone who believes in me will live even after dying." What? Everyone, he says, everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. The resurrection changes everything. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 6, it says this, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. And then he was seen by Peter 
and then by the 12, and after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most whom are still alive, though some have died. At the writing of this passage, about 100 years later, we're, we're seeing that, that he said, a lot of these people are still alive, but some have died, they've gone on, and I want to tell you something. If you're going to write a story, like in our culture today, it's really popular to just make up any kind of history you want and just say it over and over and over again until people believe it. I don't buy it because I know how to read and I know how to think. I, was, I grew up back when we actually taught people how to think for themselves. Sorry, I'm on a little mini rant here, but I, I feel like I, if I got an amen, it could turn nasty. So please don't respond yet. But I'm just saying, I know how to read a book. I've lived enough history that I know what the reality of life is. And here's what I want you to know. If you're going to make up a story like the resurrection, you better wait till the witnesses die. <laughs> 500 at one time are seeing a risen Jesus. Let me tell you something. The resurrection changes everything we don't have to fear death anymore we don't have to fear dying why because God has promised us an everlasting life not only are our sins forgiven not only do we get to spend eternity in heaven but we don't have to be afraid on the way John 10 10 I have come that you might have abundant life abundant life listen Chuck Colson some of you might remember him uh, some of you that are old enough remember him for different reasons than he's remembered today, thank the Lord. He's remembered mostly today, and he passed on several years ago, but he's remembered mostly today for his work in founding and, and running uh, Prison Fellowship. And he was, he was the one that was instrumental in helping those who were incarcerated find Jesus and find support for their, for their loved ones and whatnot as they went through that process, that arduous process of being incarcerated. And what a blessing and what a tremendous testimony he was. One of the most brilliant lawyers of his time, and you might remember him if you're old enough or if you read some history that wasn't made up yesterday, that, uh, that he was a special prosecutor, a special attorney that was uh, access, a special counselor to President Nixon. And of course, Watergate, was, which is a horrible thing where there was deception. There was all kinds of things that happened. Wait a minute, was that... Oh, yeah, that was back in the Nixon era about trying to steal an election. But anyway, um, so, so he got caught, and, and Chuck Colson was one of his attorneys, and, and he, got, he went to prison, as did a lot of them in that group. He says this about the resurrection, and I quote. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact. I know the resurrection is a fact. And Watergate proved it to me. I read that and I thought, what? <laughs> he goes, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, put to prison, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate, listen to this, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world at that time, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. <laughs> he goes on to say, you're telling me that 12, to 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible, end quote. I want to tell you something, friends. We don't have to fear death any longer because the resurrection changes everything. Third thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we now have God's Spirit living in us. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. That's that group that was seen on the hillside that day watching Jesus, the risen Jesus that was giving them some instructions before he was ascended into heaven. 
He said this to his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The apostle Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter one, verse 19 and 20 says, I also pray that you will understand, listen to this, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in a place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. We need a power source to fulfill God's power for our lives. Whether it's wind power, solar power, batteries plugging into an outlet, you have to have that connection to the power source or you can't fulfill your purpose. A blender can't fulfill its purpose unless it's plugged into the wall, right? A cordless drill can't fulfill its purpose until you engage that battery. On and on it goes. You can draw your own illustrations, but I want to say this. If God's power can raise a dead Jesus, he can raise a dead marriage. If God's power can raise a dead Jesus, he can raise a dead career. And if God's power can raise a dead Jesus, he can raise a dead dream. I want to ask you this this morning. What is it that you need that resurrection power in your life to engage and to ignite a fire within you that will allow God's purpose? Listen, we need to be walking in God's purpose. We can't do that apart from the power source, his Holy Spirit, which he's provided for us. I want you to think about what happened to those disciples, that first generation disciples that saw with their own eyes and were convinced till their death. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to ruin your Easter lunch or dinner, but I'm telling you what, the, you, can, you can look at, go to Fox Book of Martyrs or go to some of these other sources, historical sources, not just the Bible, historical sources, and you'll find that these guys died horrible deaths and never denounced the truth that Jesus lives. I'm just, I'll, I'll throw a couple at you. Boiled to death, burned to death, pulled apart, and never once said, no, nah, we just made it up. Every one of them went gladly to that place of surrender of their everything, the, the ultimate sacrifice, because they knew what they saw. And the power of Jesus Christ the resurrection changes everything. It took a group of fearful and made them fearless. It took a group of cowards and made them courageous. It took a group of hopeless and made them hope-filled. Let me give you the last one. I believe that the resurrection of Jesus fills us with hope because it reminds us we have an eternal home waiting for us. Hey, here's just a little bullet point. There's heaven at the end of this. You know, I mean, sometimes we get so caught up in here and now, we, we're so worried about what we're going through right this minute that we forget there's a heaven waiting for us. Hallelujah. If you're trying to tell somebody what heaven is like, I mean, the words fail us, don't they? The only word I can think of that really adequately works here is indescribable. Because here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. He said, speaking of heaven, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. I'm going to read that one more time. I want you to listen carefully. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I want you to think about that for just a moment. In fact, I don't often do this, but I want you just to kind of, in your mind's eye, let your imagination kind of run wild for a moment. And I want you to think about things, beautiful things, that you've seen or experienced in your lifetime. Think about it for just a second. Just take a moment. And don't, you don't have to shout them out or anything, but just capture those in your mind and see them again and think about all those wonderful things 
You've, I've heard some beautiful music. It says no ear is heard. I've heard some beautiful, I heard some beautiful music today. Hey, give it up for the worship team. That was amazing. I've heard some beautiful music before that actually moved me to tears. It was so beautiful. I've heard music that moved me to tears for a different reason. But, but I mean, I've heard music that just, I mean, it's like, whoo, caught up. It gives you chills. Whenever I read this verse, I think of, I think of Disneyland and I think of Walt Disney. I think, of what in the world? Well, it says, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love. Walt Disney was the biggest visionary we've ever seen in the history of our lifetime. Here's a guy that saw an orange field, and then the eighth wonder of the world came about. Pardon me, I'm partial to Disneyland, as you might see. This guy saw things nobody else had even heard of before. And the Bible says, no ears heard, and it hasn't even come into our imagination what God has. But let me get back to that first one. No eye has seen. I have seen. Have you captured it? Do you know what? Are you looking, thinking of something in your head about the, something beautiful that you've seen? I mean, I've, I've stood as close as my uh, fear of heights will allow me at the edge of the Grand Canyon, looked over that tremendous chasm and thought to myself, dear Lord, there's nothing like this I've ever seen before. I've, I've seen some amazing things. And you're going to say I'm sappy with this, but I'm hopeless romantic. But I, was just, I just think back to that day when I saw, when I looked at the end of the aisle, no eye has seen. I looked down at the end of that aisle and I saw the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life in her wedding gown. And she was coming to me. Beautiful. I, I think of my kids. My kids were born. And I walked up and I took that baby and I thought, ugly. <laughs> Hun, you gave birth to a lizard. <laughs> Come on. You know, it's like this stupid comment that every, well, every baby's cute. No, some are, have advantages, I'm just saying, but I mean, but you're sitting there and you look at that thing that looks like a dead chicken at first and then you hold it and it's like, then you realize that's my baby, that's our baby, we help make this. And man, you talk about beauty. Whew. Can I just bring you back to this verse for a second? Thinking about all that. Let me just remind you of what God has in store for us. No eye has seen. Whew, and I get a little bit chills going down my spine. No ear is heard, and it hasn't even been imagined yet what God has in, stored, in store for those who love him. I'm going to ask the worship team if they come and get ready as we wrap this up this morning, but I want to give you one more passage of Scripture. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's trying to clue them in on what's about to happen. Because just down the road is a brutal crucifixion, a betrayal crucifixion and death and then the burial and they're just giving up hope until that Easter morning. And One of my favorite passages in the Easter story is when the women are going to the tomb to, to work on Jesus and, and prepare his body and they are met by an angelic uh, figure and it, he says to them this. He says, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He's risen just as he said. I want you to, I want to ask you this question. Why do we keep living in the graveyard and hoping for life? When will we leave the things that are dead behind us and move on in the power of God's Holy Spirit with heaven in view? Why don't we take a different approach to life and experience that John 10, 10 life, a life not of existence, but more abundant. He's talking to his disciples. He says this to them in John 14, verses 1 through 3. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. There's an interesting word there, just three little letters, but it's an interesting word because it gets me to thinking. It says, it's that word let, L-E-T. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Listen, when the scripture gives us something like that, we have to stop and look and think, well, wait a minute, why would he ask me to do that if I didn't have the ability to do that? He wouldn't. 
So he says, don't let, don't allow your hearts to be troubled. Can I just ask you a personal question this morning? Are you allowing this world and the situation we live in to trouble you? Can I just remind you that the resurrection changes everything? And we don't have to let our hearts be troubled anymore. We don't have to let the enemy overwhelm us. We, don't, we can choose today to trust him. He who the grave couldn't hold is saying to us today, I'm going to hold you. The grave couldn't hold me, but I'm going to hold you. No matter what comes your way, I'm going to hold you. I'm going to be there for you. And guess what? There's heaven at the end of this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Listen, I want to tell you, when we read this today, when we read this today, it's talking to us just like it was them back. It's, listen, no matter what version you're reading, it's the living Bible. He's still speaking to us. This is to you today. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in Jesus. And he goes on to say, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place? I love verse 3. He says, when everything is ready, when everything is ready, I'm going to come and get you so that where I will be, you will be always where I am. You will always be where I am. The resurrection changes everything. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's bow our heads this morning. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our hardship, in the midst of our everyday routine, Lord, that seems sometimes to be so overwhelming and so devastating and, and so what, what a rocky ride. But Lord, in the midst of all that, remind us today, Lord, of the power of your resurrection. And Lord, the resurrection does change everything. Lord, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. We are forgiven, completely forgiven because of your gift of Calvary and Lord, because you rose, Lord, you, you made available life eternal. And so we no longer have to fear death. Lord, we have a power, not our own power, but your power living in us. And that changes everything. And Lord, with that in mind, we keep heaven in view. Lord, we do what we need to do here. And we pay attention to what we need to pay attention to here. But Lord, ahead of all of that, we have our minds focused on heaven you promised to come one day and take us so that where you are, we can be. And that changes everything. So Lord, today, we just come right here in this sacred moment. And Lord, we ask you to take inventory of our lives. And whether you're here in the building or joining us online, I want you to take this moment, just, just a moment, and allow God's Holy Spirit to search. I like to call it the, the David prayer. David cried out to God and he said this. He, goes, he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and cast me not away from your presence. Restore unto me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Lord, I pray today, wherever we are, Lord, we admit we've made mistakes. We have failed. We have not always done what you ask us to do. But Lord, today, we come to you and we say, Lord, make us right. Lord, we confess, we've sinned, we've failed, but Lord, do in us what we can't do for ourselves. Make us what you want us to be. And Lord, we ask one other thing today, and that is this. Lord, not only cleanse us, but fill us, oh God. Fill us with that power that you promised that would come, that Holy Spirit power that would ignite within us a flame, the courage, the boldness, the hope to trust in you for greater things. Lord, resurrect dead marriages, resurrect dead careers, resurrect dead dreams today. And Lord, cause us to walk in the fullness of your spirit. Take us from fearful to fearless.
from cowards to courageous, from hopeless to hope-filled. Do that work in us today, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Stand with me if you're able, would you please? I want to pray a, a blessing over you today. And I want you to go in his grace and his power. And then we're going to go out singing again, a great song of the church. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would instill in each and every one of us here and online, oh God, a spirit of your power and your peace, a spirit of your hope and your joy. Lord, may the same thrill that they experienced on that resurrection morn, may it well up within us, and may we look at life differently today going forward. Fill our lives with courage and hope and joy. And may we walk out of here sharing the message that the resurrection changes everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today.